All righty, folks, we have Soli back. In our first episode together, we learned how she got her first deal in Cincinnati. She did it the right way by finding an investor. It wasn't about the core four and all that nonsense. It's about finding an investor that's been there, done that, and tagging along. Now we're going to find out how she scaled and quit her nine to five at 23. Yes, I'm a little bit jealous <laughs> she quit at 23. Soli, how you doing? Good. Thanks for having me on part two. All right. So it's time to make me feel inferior. How did you scale and quit your job at 23? Because that is amazing. What were come, some of the key steps along the way? Yeah. So we talked about this a little bit in the last episode, but I would say mostly partnerships and private money. So I discovered okay. private money on my second deal and I discovered partnerships in the third deal. And then we kind of combined those two things to end up buying like 25 units in the first year. I would say that's really fast for a new year. Yeah, and really in hindsight, fast. like we were buying only value add properties. Like in, in trying to do, there was a lot of things I learned from this time in my life. It was really difficult. But at the peak, we were doing like 19 renovations at once from 2,500 miles away. Really difficult. And so sounds sexy. Um, but I caught- oh, this, That sounds like a nightmare. No, I've been, <laughs> I've been in the game a long time. That sounds scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, there's no better way to learn than putting your feet to the fire. And I think I was all in at that time. I was like, let's freaking do this. And so, um, we bought like, after those first three properties we talked about last episode, we ended up buying a five unit cold called the five unit that was next to the triplex, bought it with a partner, hard money. And then after that, we bought a 10 unit. So between them, we had 15 units. Um, and that was, um, a commercial loan and mixture with private money as well. And so, so let me, so let's talk about, it cause it, it's funny that, cause my, I started with houses and then my next, like my, so I guess it would, for me, it would have been my ninth deal and 10th deal. There was a five and a 10. It's, it's funny how it works okay, out. Yeah. Um, I got to tell you getting experience with singles and then jumping to five or 10, that was a wake up call. Different, yes. different kind of tenants, different yeah. repair, different, I mean, different turnover. Yeah. I was caught by surprise. Mm -hmm. And I would say now we're back to the single families <laughs> and I, I actually prefer them in the Me duplexes. Too. I, yes. I love a good duplex, right? So five units and 10 units, especially like over in Cincinnati, I would say they're typically in at least the ones that I bought are not in the nicest areas. And so oh, you're yeah. dealing with more like yeah. section eight tenants, um, which is fine. Like it's a good diversification strategy, but there's a lot more maintenance in terms of like common areas oh, yeah. and like dealing with like tenant issues and when they just don't like each other. Yeah. And, you, yeah. You're, you become a, I'm not a consultant, but like somebody's <laughs> counselor, you're a counselor. So <laughs> yeah. gosh, I'm, I don't, yeah, I, uh, if I had to do it all over again, it was building from scratch. I might do just singles and duplexes. I really might. I think I would delete the 10 unit for sure. Um, but it was a really good learning experience um, on a whole lot of different levels. Sure. But yeah, and so after that, we also flipped some more houses. Again, like we were talking about, it was impossible to lose in 2021 on flipping. So I think we flipped yeah. like maybe three or four properties and made some good money. Felt like we were the best people ever. <laughs> <laughs> like $45,000. Like we did everything wrong. <laughs> um, yeah. Then the market funny. turned. And it was a yeah. different story. Um, but yeah, after that, those, those are our two biggest properties. Um, I bought them uh, with a, with a partner, all, all of those properties, just one partner. So we were 50, 50 equity partners. He was bringing a lot of the money and I was doing a lot of the work. And by that point, um, when I quit my job, it was like October of 2021. And we had, you know, I was living super frugally. So it was like my living expenses, I don't know, like $2,000. I had like a paid off car, even in the Bay Area. I was like, I'm going to live in a shoe box and I'm okay right. with it. And my income from my rental properties can cover that like worst case scenario. Nice. In my head, I was spending so much time like working on real estate anyways. Like imagine what I could do if I put a hundred percent of my focus into it. Yeah. So, so where do you go kind of the, the last 12 months? Because obviously the market turned, obviously the market kind of turned off last July, August, Q4 of last year was really bad. I have a lot of flippers who lost six figures as we went to January and February of this year. Did you get caught up in that or did you, did you hit the pause button in time to be safe? Um, we actually pivoted on 
two flips and turned them into rentals, but they are fantastic rentals. So okay. I think one of the, the good parts about investing in a lower cost market is that the price to rent ratios still work really well mm -hmm. for the secondary exit strategies. And we were able to burr those properties and okay. still cash flow. They cash flow great, like 500 bucks a rental still, like even with high. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so um, those ones were fine. So we ended up, I, we ended up partnering in a third market with a third second market with a third partner. So, um, early, like, I guess last year, 2022, I get confused on years. Um, I had a friend who like, I've been friends with him for maybe two or three years. He scaled to like 150 units really fast. Same time. Um, yeah, really fast less painful than mine, <laughs> I would say. And so he owned like a construction and a property management firm in Augusta, Georgia. And so okay. very similar of what you're saying, like find an investor who's done it, who has the systems, this and that. It was like, okay, I think that we can scale even faster if we all three of us partner together and we all mm -hmm. focus on what we're best at. So we ended up, I think when we left Cincinnati, it was maybe like 25 units or so. And then we ended up migrating over to Augusta, Georgia where the master's tournament is and mm -hmm. the type of inventory there is a little bit different. So there's less, a lot less multifamilies, a lot more single families. So we've been okay. buying a bunch of single families over there and either still flipping. So we still find that the flipping market is fine over there. It's pretty low cost. Um, and then also burring because the price to rent ratios are like superb over there. It's even cheaper than Cincinnati. So I have no idea what a property costs in Augusta, Georgia. What, what are, what are some of the price points you've paid? I'm just curious. I have no idea. So class C and like section eight type of rentals, we've bought properties from 60 to $90,000. So they're pretty affordable. And then and you, you have to repair them. You got make ready costs. Yes, but it's a lot cheaper. So when you're working in older markets like Cincinnati, you're working with like, I think our oldest building is 1880. And oh, so a small renovation is like $50,000. And yeah. it's difficult because you're tearing up open plaster walls and you're finding knob and tube. <laughs> And like the basements are flooding and like all sorts of stuff. But when we went yeah. over to Augusta, a lot of the inventory is built in more like the 1950s. It's just like oh. a like a rancher. Like I was like, wow, renovations are so much easier. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Our smallest renovation was like seven thousand dollars, and I was like, okay. What? And so yeah, it, it was wild. Like we had a property that we bought for about sixty-seven thousand dollars. We put in seven thousand dollars. It appraised for one twenty, and it was. Wow. And so it's just a different type of market, right? So I would say our renovations are kind of between ten and thirty thousand dollars typically, where our renovations in Cincinnati are like fifty to a hundred thousand dollars. Wow. So Lee, you're this you're Gen Z, right? That's not that's... I'm, Gen, I'm the last Gen I'm the last year for Gen Z. So I'm an old Gen Z. You're an old Gen Z. Okay. What would you tell a Gen Z? Because again, generally speaking, they're younger, right? They're mm -hmm. in their twenties. They're in their early twenties. Early 20s. Uh, and teens, probably. What would you tell a Gen Z? What would you tell yourself at 18, 19, 20 year old? Would you tell them to give real estate a shot? Would you would you tell them it's you're priced out? Don't bother. The system's working against you. I mean, wh what would you tell your peers? I mean, just imagine if you bought something at 18, 30 years later, you're like 48 years old and you have a bunch of paid off properties like that would be insane I would say time is on your side like the younger you can get started the better but the best thing you can do is surround yourself with other people who are doing it because the average person is going to probably be a naysayer like you can't yeah. do that you're too young the market sucks interest rates are too high and there's a lot of reasons why it's like not the perfect time to invest it never will mm. be the perfect time. But if you can find mentors or, you know, I think you interview like Cody and Christian and like Cody was like 18 years old. Yeah. So find people like that who are actually doing what you want to do and just like tag along, be their best friend, find a mentor. And if you can change your circle, you can change a lot of your mindset and yeah. what you can do possible. I think that, I think that's one of the biggest things. Is you, it's hard. I get it. You've had friends since you were in high school, but let's be clear. Some of them suck. <laughs> they're pull, they're holding you back. Uh, you yeah. need to get some new friends, new circles, and, and it's absolutely possible if you do the work. If you do, the, I mean, you're living on two grand a month. I I I've, I've talked to seniors in high school, and I ask them every time, "Can you live on two grand a month?" Mm -hmm. And all of them say yes because they have no idea what stuff costs, right? <laughs> yeah. But the but the point of the question solely is, if you can live on two grand a month at 18 and do that for the next five years, yeah. you could be financially free. 
by 23, 24, 25. It's not that hard. Mm-hmm. Right? You just got to get started. So um, I yeah. encourage Gen Z's to give it a shot. I do too. And that's kind of what the pandemic did for me is it t- took me like, it's like me into a vortex of goodbye college friends, goodbye every friends, like goodbye everybody. And let me rebuild my friend group. And I actually chose to do that online with my Instagram. And it's crazy how much you feed yourself with content. You know, yeah. you, you don't realize how much you can curate what you look at. But if you're looking at like basketball or like partying or cars, like that's going to be what you want to spend your time or on. Or doom, doom. Don't forget it's doom. There's a lot of negativity. Yeah. Yep. But if you fill yourself with, you know, Michael Zuber, then like you're going to know that it's possible and you're going to find a way to, to do it. So Lee, one more time, where can people find you? And, and also just keep doing what you're doing. You keep, you keep showing them where, sh- show everybody where it's at. Instagram and it's lattes.and.lisas. Thank you so much. So much fun.